Thank you. So I started my career in the biodefense field, managing programs funded by the government for a defense contractor, but always was interested in the aging space. Then I got the opportunity to join i Therapeutics, a drug discovery pharmaceutical company focusing on developing therapies for age-related diseases. I came on board as the extramural research director. At that time, i was offering boutique contract research services and my role included um, managing client projects, interfacing with clients, and liaising with the technical teams. So during my time in that role, we started to notice that we had an increased demand in our services and also realized that we needed a change in our management structure. Therefore, we decided to launch Icaria Life Sciences, a contract research organization focused on aging research. As an i portfolio company, Icaria manages all of our extramural research. So for this talk, I will take you through our approach for drug discovery and highlight some of the challenges and how we overcome them. I would love to talk about the progress we're making on our own drug targets. However, we work on confidential programs and I can't really talk about it. But I will be giving you some relevant examples. So here's the typical process for small molecule drug discovery. It starts with high throughput screening where entire compound libraries are screened against a chosen protein drug target. The resulting hits provide the starting point for drug design during lead optimization where molecular uh, changes can be made to improve function. Once a drug or drugs are selected, admit properties are analyzed to determine which ones have the highest chance of clinical success. IND is the key milestone before clinical trials in humans. IND enabling studies are generally GLP grade and involve maximum tolerated dose, repeated dose toxicity, and safety pharmacology studies. If a product is deemed reasonably safe for initial human studies, then it can move on to phase one. The goal of phase one is to determine the dose and the schedule for the next phase in clinical trials. So for our small molecule drug development and thinking about aging pathways, we will focus on the first three steps because we believe that that's where many of the bottlenecks are in drug discovery. We've broken out those steps into the following drug discovery process, where we screen compounds, run specificity and selectivity studies, perform admit analysis, and animal studies. Before I move on, I want to mention that the steps in this process can vary depending on the unique needs of the program. For example, if we modify a compound to meet specificity or admit requirements, then that modified compound goes back through the initial steps of our drug discovery program. If early on we find a very promising target, we might want to run it through admit analysis before moving on to the next step. Perhaps we already have a compound or a family compounds of interest, then we probably can bypass the first initial screen. How do we identify initial hits on new pathways? Well, before we can start any drug discovery program, we need a large supply of the protein drug target in order for analysis and to develop assays. Protein production can be very challenging for aging pathways because the targets are novel and not very well characterized. In addition, Many proteins are difficult to recombinantly express and result in misfolded protein or inactive protein. You do have the choice to purchase some of these protein targets. However, generally vendors don't run bioactivity assays and these proteins can be non-functional. Poor quality protein will lead to poor quality results. 
the way we overcome this challenge is by using a proprietary protein expression technology called the RP tag. It allows us to increase the rates and the yield for full length and biologically active protein production. In many cases, it's allowed us to express difficult proteins in E. coli, which is rapid, most economical, and yields the highest amount of protein production. Once we have our protein production method in place, then we can run our primary compound screen. Our go-to assay is fluorescence polarization on the microplate scale. This allows us to screen hundreds of thousands of compounds to millions of compounds. How do we confirm our hits are real? Once we have our initial hits, we can take a deeper dive and start to understand how these molecules work. Ideally, we would like to have a protein structure with the molecule bound so we can see how they fit together. However, with novel targets in the, for aging pathways, we don't have a lot of structure information. In the absence of structure information, we use orthogonal screens to start to define the structure function relationships. Biophysical assays such as 2D NMR allows, allow us to see the direct binding affinity between the small molecule and the protein. In addition, methods such as STD NMR and 3D NMR inform the specific areas on the small molecule and the protein that are driving the interaction. This helps us understand where to modify the small molecules to improve function. So how do we engineer on-target specificity? For this example, I'm using the M mTOR pathway to illustrate mechanism specificity. Many are interested in targeting mTOR complex 1 and not mTOR complex 2. These two complexes have proteins in common. So if you start with the compound in green here, you'll notice that it can bind both complexes. Through iterations, we can optimize the compound, creating an analog shown here in purple that will selectively bind to mTOR complex one. This can be verified through biophysical assays. It's important to test for specificity and run counter screens to improve potency and avoid off-target effects. Once we have compounds that perform expectedly in biophysical assays, then we need to run them in biological systems. How do we ensure biological relevance? Typically, we start by looking in the literature for cellular models. However, as Nature published in 2012, there's a lot of issues with reproducibility of published studies. Amgen, a reputable long-standing biotechnology company, selected 53 landmark preclinical oncology studies to repeat. Out of those 53 studies, they were only able to re reproduce the data from six of those studies. That's only 11%. Inadequate cell lines and animal models were thought to be the culprit. Even for our senescence program, we've noticed a high level of variability in the literature regarding how to generate senescent cells. Here I have three examples of how to induce senescence in IMR90 cells using doxorubicin. Each study uses a different concentration of doxorubicin, different induction times, and a different harvest time point, among other differences. So where do we start? Which do we go with? So our process requires that we develop and validate cellular models resulting in robust, reproducible standard methods before testing um, in the cells. This is very important because inconsistent manufacturing equates to irreproducible data. So is our pathway conserved in our model species? So there are nuances in animal models that we have to be aware of, and we can appreciate the differences on the macro level. This figure compares the anatomy of the human arm to three other species. As you can see, there are some differences. Sometimes these differences matter, and sometimes they don't. The bones in the hand have a very different function across all four species. 
However, the ulna bone highlighted in red serves the same purpose. The same can be said for the molecular level. Does our compound only work in humans? Does it work in mice? If we're working with a protein target that's 80% homologous in mice, is that function conserved? To answer these questions, we need to re um, we need to run the target species protein through the whole process in order to validate their utility as a model. If we don't do this analysis, we run the risk of having a false negative in an animal study for a drug that may be potent. So what indication do we choose? Up until now, all the steps we performed uh, rely on controlling experiments properly and using robust models. When it comes to admit analysis and animal models, the aging research takes a different path. In traditional drug discovery, the indications are very clear. However, with aging research, um, the indications are very complex. So what do we go after? Do we go for a systemic approach or a localized approach? When we're looking at pathways that are involved in many diseases, which indication do we go after first? What if we have a first-in-class compound? If we have a first-in-class compound, we might want to go with a localized approach to avoid undesirable systemic effects. So this is all part of a very detailed strategic conversation that varies by program. Admin analysis help predict which compounds have the highest chance of clinical success by informing bioavailability and toxicity. The admin properties play into the indications and play into the strategy of the treatment. This, for aging pathways, this requires a constant conversation between clinical teams and the development teams. The roots of administration change the number of biological barriers that a, a compound must go through and the metabolic mechanisms. For example, chronic diseases of aging are conventionally treated daily. These tra daily treatments are typically oral medicines that require high oral bioavailability that may not be required for an injectable. An oral medicine is exposed to lower pHs and metabolic enzymes in the GI tract. Once it's absorbed into the bloodstream, they can be cleared by the liver, taking it out of circulation. In contrast, a localized therapy, such as an osteoarthritis treatment that gets injected directly into the knee joint, does not have nearly as many barriers and does not need to travel um, away from the knee joint. So admit properties inform how the body affects the compound and how the compound affects the body. So how do aging models differ from traditional models? Naturally, when we're performing aging research, we would like to use aging animal models. This table shows a list of symptoms of aging mice. As you can see, my old mice are prone to age-related diseases, and they're very different from their younger counterparts. Old mice are prone to weight gain, cancer, stress, among other complications. So when using old mice in studies, there are considerations that must be taken into account, such as longer acclimation periods before starting the study, or understanding the physiological differences between the old and the young when deciding on the experimental endpoints. We also have to take into account how old mice affect bioavailability of our compound. For example, if you have a lipid-soluble compound, it can accumulate in the fat of the overweight mice, taking it out of circulation and also hindering its elimination from the body. In addition, reduced blood flow can impede drug delivery. So there are many considerations when it comes to aging research, and we have 
a lot of experience with everything I spoke about today, including the biophysical assays, cellular assays, and animal models. Through our biochemistry, cell biology, and husbandry departments, we routinely perform all these services in-house for our, our clients and our portfolio companies. Depending on the client needs, we can do anything from performing single projects to managing whole programs as if they're one of our portfolio, as if they're a portfolio company. In addition, through Grapeseed Bio, our a strategic investment fund. We can offer in-kind services or funding for startups that may not have our capabilities or can, have, can benefit from our expertise. Thank you.